Hi, and welcome to Score Beyond's ACT Up Crash Course. My name is Chelsea Heggie, and I am an expert ACT tutor here to help you prepare for your upcoming ACT exam. First, let's talk about when the ACT is offered. This fall, you can take the ACT on September 10th, October 22nd, and December 10th. Now, the good news is if you're a senior and you have not taken the exam yet, or you significantly need to improve your score, most colleges will accept all three of these exams. If you're trying to apply early decision or early action, you should double check with the college you're applying to about the October 22nd exam. Most likely they will not accept the December 10th exam, but again, the best way to check is to call the college that you're applying to. They will tell you very clearly which test dates they accept. Now, if you're a junior, these are three dates to choose from. You do not have to take the first one of the year, but you also don't have to put off taking the exam depending on your goal score. The best thing to do if you're a junior is to plan on a test date that you have adequate time to prepare for. Meaning, if you're busy all fall, maybe we should take a test later in the spring. You also have tests coming up in February, April, and June of this year. Now, if you're a sophomore, this is just great information to plan on. You don't need to take it early, but if you would like to, these are the test dates you have to choose from. Now, if you haven't taken the ACT before, let's go over the structure of the exam. If you have, bear with us and maybe refresh some information you had forgotten. So, the exam always has four multiple choice sections. The test always begins with the English portion of the exam, which you have 45 minutes to complete 75 questions. You then immediately start on the math portion of the exam where you have 60 minutes to complete 60 questions. After the math portion, you'll always be given a short break. Now, on this break, you're allowed to stand up, walk around, go to the bathroom. I do not recommend that you lay your head down and take a nap. Time and time again I've seen students do this and time and time again I've seen them not be awake for the second half of the test. You want to do things to help keep your energy up, not deplete it. And this is a long day for you to be testing, so make sure you're doing your best to stay focused for the whole time. Once everyone's settled back into the room, you will immediately start the reading section where you have 35 minutes to complete 40 questions and then finish up by going straight into the science section where you also have 35 minutes to complete 40 questions. Now, this is where people's experiences will diverge. If you're taking the ACT with writing, you'll have a five minute break while they allow everyone not taking the essay portion to leave, and then you'll go into your 30 minutes for your one essay. Now, the ACT essay is listed as optional. What does that really mean? The ACT essay is optional for colleges to consider. This means if you're applying to colleges that consider the essay, you are required to take it. So optional is optional for colleges, not for you. The only reason you should not take the essay portion of the exam is if it, all the schools you're applying to don't even consider it or you already have an essay score that they're happy with and that is being sent with the school. Again, the best way to confirm if you should take ACT with writing or not is to confirm with the colleges you're applying to. They will tell you their policy on the ACT writing section. Now, the ACT is scored on a scale from 1 to 36, but we have a few different places where we're going to see these numbers. First off is going to be the composite score. The composite score is the average of our four section scores that we went over previously, English, math, reading, and science. So all they do is they score each of these sections also from a one to 36 scale, add them up and divide by four. This is how we receive our composite. Now, the good news is because it's being averaged, when your average exactly has a decimal and that decimal is at least 0.5, they will round up your score. So for example, if you get a 23.5, you will get a 24 officially on the ACT. So you have a little bit of give room as long as you're at at least 0.5, close to the goal score you have. If you have a 23.25, it will be rounded down to a 23. So do your best to do your best in every section so you can get as high of a score as possible. Now, a lot of students ask, what is a good score on the ACT? Well, 
a good score is the score that's going to get you into the college you want to go to. Now, typically most colleges are going to require you at least achieve a score that's near the national average. And depending on the year, the national average is anywhere from a 19 to a 21 composite, typically closer to a 19 to 20. So if you're not quite at this range, we really should help you improve your score so that you can be at least at this range and have some choices as far as colleges to attend. Many colleges though have a higher requirement and will ask for a score of at least a 22, 23, 24, even 25 and above. If you're applying to Ivy League schools or other um, elite competitive universities, you're, also, you're looking at a score of more like a 32 at least to be eligible to attend those universities. Again, the best way to know what score will get you into the school you wanna attend is to talk to the school. Every school readily posts their average SAT and ACT scores on their admissions website. If you have any questions about that, you can call their admissions department directly and they will give you a range of scores that they typically accept. Now, remember, this isn't a promise that if you get that score, you'll get in, but it's gonna give you a much better chance than if you're below the range they're looking for. Now, again, there are a lot of misconceptions about what is actually on the ACT itself. So let's break down every section and talk about what information you need to know to do well on this exam. For the English portion of the exam, they test your knowledge of grammar, punctuation, sentence structure, and what they call rhetorical skills. Rhetorical skills just means can you use sentences correctly to achieve specific goals? So for example, can you pick a sentence that evokes a particular image or is the best introduction or conclusion sentence or that evokes a particular emotion? They will always provide you with exactly what they're looking for and your job is always to pick the sentence that reflects that goal. Now, math is where we have the most confusion. A lot of juniors and seniors these days, if you're on advanced track, are in classes such as pre-calculus, calculus, um, and none of this is actually tested on the exam. 90% of the exam is much more basic math skills that you might have learned way back in middle school or closer to ninth grade. So we need to be able to do our basic arithmetic really well, adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing. You need to know how to use your order of operations, things like exponents and square roots and other radicals. Of course, you have to be able to use um, basic algebra skills, so they're going to want to know that you understand how to move things effectively in an equation and solve, or in an inequality and solve for a variable. They want to make sure that you understand how to use basic geometry formulas and basic facts about our basic shapes. And by basic, I really mean basic. Triangles, squares, circles, these are the most common tested geometry shapes on the exam. They want to know that you know how to plot a line and they want to know that you understand functions. These are the most common topics tested. There is no calculus on this exam, so if you're in an extremely advanced math class, your job might be to review old content, not learn new content. So let's all keep this in mind when you're practicing those questions. Don't look for the hardest way to do a math problem, look for the easiest. For the reading exam, again, this is a much more simple exam than you might be expecting, particularly if you're getting ready for AP literature or language this year. The ACT reading section is all about basic reading comprehension skills. It is not gonna be asking you about complex literary devices or to do detailed literary analysis. They wanna know, can you read a paragraph and answer a question based on that information? Can you pair an answer choice with the appropriate evidence based in the passage? not to achieve a very complex literary goal, but just to match basic information. Do you understand what is said in the passage and what is not? The science section has the most fear associated with it. Most students are terrified of the science section, whether or not it's a strong area for them in school or not. There's a lot of misconception thinking, oh, well, I haven't taken AP Physics or AP Chem, or I just don't know enough science to do well. You don't need to know scientific content to excel on the science portion of the ACT. What the science portion of the ACT tests is your ability to interpret data. So can you read a table, graph, or chart and understand what information is presented to you on it? 
can you understand the relationships between the things tested on this graph or table or chart? And can you make predictions or conclusions based on this data provided? They also want to make sure you understand the core of the scientific method, that we need to create a hypothesis, test our hypothesis with an experiment, collect data from that experiment, and then analyze the data to make a conclusion. If you've done an eighth grade science fair, chances are you, need, you know everything you need to to excel on the science section. They like to make it seem more complicated than it is, put lots of complicated sounding information, but when you look at what the questions actually ask you to do, most of the time it's just pluck information off a graph, identify a relationship on a graph, or make a prediction based on the data provided in a graph. Now, the essay. If you're taking the ACT writing, this section is for you. Again, the essay is technically optional, but that means optional for colleges. Please check with the colleges you're applying to to decide whether or not to take the writing portion of the exam. If you're not sure, the best thing to do is just to take it anyway, just in case. Now, the good news is if this is not your favorite section, it is not included in that composite score. So this is a separate section for schools to evaluate your writing skills, but it does not impact your official ACT score. Now, for the moment, it's scored on a 1 through 36 scale, and the four categories you're graded on are your use of ideas and your ability to analyze those ideas, how you develop and support your argument, the organization of your essay, and your use of language. Now, here's a sample essay prompt. So you'll always be given a description of a particular situation or problem. In here we're discussing intelligent machines and how they do more work in the world rather than humans. And then you're presented with three perspectives on this issue. Your job is to make an argument about this issue. So you can pick one of the three perspectives provided or you can create your own perspective. The goal is you have to have a single argument in your essay. You can't say sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. You need to actually pick a position and support and develop that position. We always want to use as many concrete examples as possible, not hypothetical scenarios. And we want to write a clear, logically formal essay, meaning this is the organization you're being graded on. You need an introduction, you need body, you need a conclusion. And I can tell you right now, if your essay is only one page front, that's a little too short. You should be shooting for a page and a half to two full pages um, to completely do all of the work you need to do in this essay. Now, as far as language use, they're not going to be overly critical here. They know this is a timed essay with limited time for you to edit. So a few typos here and there aren't going to make a difference. What they're evaluating on the language use is, do you have repeated and consistent mistakes that show you don't understand a part of grammar or punctuation or sentence structure. As long as you overall have a clear and grammatically correct essay, you're not going to be given a significantly low score in this area. Now, let's talk about the points you need to achieve a specific goal score. <coughs> now, Scoring on the ACT points to scaled score is very different than the scoring you're used to seeing in school. To get an average score on the ACT, again, part of the national average, you typically only need half the points. So for example, on math, you only need 30 to 32 points to get a 20. Getting an average score on the ACT is like getting a C to a C plus. Now, 50% in school is definitely an F. So we want to keep in mind, half can be great here. If we even just increase this by 10 questions, get 40 out of the 60 questions correct, now you have a 25 on the ACT, which is an above average score that puts you in about, let's say, the B plus range, if we're going to relate it to letter grades. So keep in mind, if you need a specific score, you should check to find out how many points you need, because chances are you're rushing through making silly mistakes when you could slow down and get the adequate points you need to achieve your goal score. The only section you typically need over half is the English portion. And that's because typically most students do better on this section, that getting 49 to 51 points is about average. 
So that's how we get the 20 in the English section. Now, pacing and guessing. Let's actually jump ahead to guessing. We just talked about making sure that you pick, you would try the correct number of questions to get your goal score. Now, for all questions you can't get to, say you run out of time or you decide that they're not worth your time, we don't leave them blank, but we do not randomly guess. The statistically best thing to do is to pick one letter for the entire exam and fill it in for everything. That way, you have a one out of four chance of being right without trying. They're essentially like free points. So let's say you fill in that letter for 15 questions. Statistically, you should get three to four of those correct, meaning you get three to four additional free points. As long as you get the questions you're attempting correctly, these free points will help give you a buffer and hopefully a little boost in your score. Now, this is very important when we talk about pacing, especially for those of you who wanna do great, but maybe aren't necessarily sure of what score you should get or how to get to that score. Please do not attempt, meaning significantly try all of the questions if you haven't already scored a 30 on the ACT. This can be on a practice test, this can be on an official test. Most students should not be attempting to answer every question. Most students should be attempting to answer half to three quarters of the questions in order to improve their score. Again, for any questions outside of this pacing goal, we're gonna use the strategy we just talked about and just fill in one letter for everything we don't have time to get to or we have no idea how to answer. It is important that you spend the time that you have on the questions you know you're likely to get correct. Most students reverse this idea and spend the most quest time on questions they don't know how to do. This is a horrible strategy because it means you're going to rush through questions that you do know how to do, most likely miss some to a lot unnecessarily, and not at all get close to your goal score. You wanna take the time it takes to do the questions you know how to do correctly. Any additional time is spent picking your way through the remaining questions to add as many points to your basket as possible. Anything you don't know how to do, again, we stick with filling in that one letter for the entire exam to get free points with, random, with a guess. Now, here's a great question. When do I just fill in my letter and when do I make an actual educated guess or how do I know what to do instead. So when we can eliminate one to two answer choices and you see something that seems right, then guessing is a good plan. Especially if we can eliminate two of the answer choices as definitely, definitely wrong. That might eliminate the letter that you're sticking with for the exam. In that case, you should go with your gut and make an educated guess. There is a difference between random guessing and making an educated guess and eliminating answer choices definitively is part of that process. Now, there are some other guidelines we can use to help improve your chances of being right when you're making an educated guess. For example, on the reading portion of the exam, you wanna avoid extreme words such as always, never, only. These are typically not correct, and for them to be correct, you would have to find exactly verbatim what the answer choice is saying in the passage with the same intent. I've very, very rarely seen this occur, so just avoid extreme words, always, never, only. Keep those in mind and eliminate them automatically. Now, for the math section of the exam, this is a common answer choice that students see and get freaked out by. The answer cannot be determined from the given information. This option is always wrong. Every question on the math section can be solved based on the information provided. So just when you see this, automatically cross it off and keep in mind you can do this question. It's meant to psych you out to think that there must be something missing and they wouldn't put it there if you could solve it. Every question is solvable, so don't let that disturb you. Now. A lot of you may be asking, hey, I have an ACT coming up. How can I get started? What should I be doing now? What you should be doing now is get started practicing an ACT app. So as you can see here, we've provided our app name, a screenshot of how the app will look on your phone, 
our ratings, which are stellar by the way, and let you know that you can download the app for free in the App Store or Google Play Store, depending on if you have an iPhone or an Android phone. Now, when you click that little profile button in the top right hand corner, you should, at the end of your profile, there'll be a slot for an invite code. In that invite code, you can enter the code NSHSS and you will get free unlimited premium access, which allows you to practice all of our 3000 test questions and our full length test to prepare for the ACT. This is all offered free to you as members of the National Society of High School Scholars. So please take advantage, get as much practice in as you can. The app decides what you should work on. So the great thing about it is once you take your 20 question diagnostic test, it will tell you what to work on. It will design workouts specifically based on your unique strengths and weaknesses. It'll also continue to explore areas it doesn't know about you so that it can give you the best picture possible about the amount of about how you're performing on the exam. You'll be able to review your practice history in the app, look at the questions you're getting right, wrong, you're going to be able to see how much time you're spending on it, and you'll also be able to see how you're performing in individual categories. Now, we also offer, just to NSHSS members, special discounts on our private tutoring that occurs over Skype. Now, the first offer, which we will also send you an email about, is a $29 trial tutoring hour. So say you're not sure if you need tutoring for the SAT or ACT, you're not sure which exam to take, you're not sure of anything. This is a great way to find out information, to test out what online tutoring is about, practice with our app and get great information and hopefully create a tutoring plan to continue with us. Once you purchase a tutoring package, we also provide special discounts that are always available to National Honor Society members. Now, any questions or concerns, please reach out to us. We're always here to help, and we'll have more informational webinars in the future. I hope you guys are having a great day, and I look forward to speaking with you soon.